Hello and welcome to day 18 of our virtual pilgrimage. Um, the place we're visiting today is the site, um, the traditional site of the Transfiguration. And this happened just six days after the story that we thought about yesterday, where Peter um, said that you are the Christ, the Messiah to Jesus. And so it's quite good to get this in its setting and its context. So let's have a look at some pictures. So it was another early start because our guide said that um, there will be queues because we could take the coach so far and then to get up to the top of the mountain, it's, a, it's the first picture that we're looking at. You can see the reflection in the um, coach windows. To get to the top, you have to get off the coach and get onto a minibus. And he said the queues for those become very great. So it was worth going early in the day. And he was absolutely right. We got straight off the coach and onto one of the minibuses. And by the time we came down, the queues were, were huge. So that was, as always, it was a good move. As I say, that mountain there that just sort of seems to rise up from nowhere is the traditional site of the Transfiguration. There is no archaeological evidence whatsoever, and it's more likely to be Mount Hermon, which is the one that you can see in the second picture, um, which is a ski resort, so it's really high, but it's not very far from Caesarea Philippi. It was even further north than where we were yesterday. And, and so it's actually the more likely um, site for the Transfiguration, but this was the one we went to. It was um, Mount Tabor that we went to that was 1,500 feet. We, as I say, we got off the coach and got onto a minibus, which left a lot to be desired. I don't think they'd have passed any tests in this country. Um, the seat belts didn't really work. There were 15 hairpins, which we squealed round at a great rate of knots to get to the top. It was quite a relief to get out at the top, quite frankly. Uh, and then we could see the church uh, in the distance along that path. Again, a beautifully kept area. The church was very unusual because it was on sort of three levels. And the level that you're looking at there, at, looking at there on the right is sort of a middle area. So there was a, a, an area below and an area above that, and that was the main altar. The um, one on the right is that one we were looking at before, and it had the most beautiful mosaic arched ceiling over the top. Really, really lovely. And at the end, you can see peacocks in the window, and peacocks are the symbol of eternal life because apparently it takes a hundred years for their feathers to decompose and so that's why they're used as a symbol of eternal life. The, the first picture is of the upper chapel area and there you can see a mosaic of Jesus being um, transfigured with Moses and Elijah on either side and the three disciples on the ground. Just before you went into the church, there were two small chapels, one to Moses and one to Elijah, because that's what um, Peter had said, shall we build shelters for these two people? From the top, you looked out over the plain, uh, sometimes called the plains of Armageddon, where it is believed that the faithful will gather at the end of time. If you remember the pictures you saw around Jerusalem and when we were going towards the Dead Sea, it is a very, very different uh, landscape for all that it was only perhaps two or three hours in the coach. A very, very different place. And this, this area is also known as the Plain of Jezreel, the breadbasket of Israel. It's so fertile that they can get three crops of wheat in any one year. So a really important area. 
So we're going to be thinking today of the uh, account of the transfiguration. Let us wake to Christ's summons, urgent in our midst. He comes to bring judgment nearer than we know. Let us wake to the truth that his power alone will last. The worlds that scorn him will vanish like a dream. Let us wake to the truth that his glory can be seen. In all the deeds that sweeten, in all the thoughts that heal. Let us wake to the truth that his reign is yet to come. That routes out the world of evil. That fulfills the world of good. We're going to read part of Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary. And beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Time to remember our sins before God. Lord, Poets and parents in God picture and pattern your ways. Forgive us for following idols and illusions. Lord, prophets shine like candles in the night. Forgive us for staying in the dark. Lord, preachers like John the Baptist clear the way for you. Forgive us for blocking your way. Lord, the Virgin Mary offered her all as the bearer of your life. Forgive us for holding ourselves back. The reading from Mark's Gospel. Six days after the incident at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. As we think about this story, 
I want you to think about Mount Hermon, which was the second one that we, we looked at a picture of. It's about twice the height of Ben Nevis. That is some climb and would take quite a long while to do because there's no cable cars or anything like that. I wonder what they talked about on the way up. Just Jesus, Peter, James and John. Did they spread out or did they stay together? What climbing have you done? How do you feel when you get to the top? I've certainly never any, ever climbed anything, anything like as high as that. And I know how I felt, exhausted. And I probably had water bottles and things with me as well. Did they have water bottles? I don't know. They would certainly have been ready for a sit down and a break. Probably still wondering why Jesus had brought them up there. Maybe they sort of had a doze because they were tired. So when they began to see this strange occurrence, maybe they thought at first that they were dreaming or half asleep. They can see Moses and Elijah with Jesus. When do they realise that this is more than a bit of an hallucination because they're tired? Peter doesn't know what to say. He was so frightened, but he blabbered something practical. Well, let's, let's build you shelters. And then a cloud envelops them. Now that's not surprising on top of a mountain, but this is no ordinary cloud because a voice comes out of it. And the voice says, this is my son, whom I love, listen to him. Then suddenly, as they look around, everything is back to normal. No cloud, no other people, no voices. Just the four of them. I wonder who spoke first. And what they said. I wonder what Jesus's reaction was. This was further confirmation that what he was doing was the right thing. And then remember what Peter had said just a few days ago. Did this confirm to him that he was right in saying that Jesus was the Christ? Who suggests that it was about time that they headed back down the mountain? Again, do they walk together? Or is Jesus on his own and the other three together? Or are they all on their own, just lost in their own thinking? If you could eavesdrop on the conversation, I wonder what they'd be saying, what they'd be thinking about, how they were feeling. Did the disciples all experience this in the same way? We read that they were discussing what rising from the dead meant. I wonder how that conversation went. They'd been told not to tell any of the other disciples about what had happened. But what do you think they said when they got to the bottom and the others asked, where have you been? It's not a story that I've ever reflected on in this way before. And I think it needs quite a bit of time to actually think yourself into that situation. 
and think about what they might have been saying and thinking. You might want to pause now and try and think about it a bit more. Or you might want to find a time later in the day. If you'd been there, how would you have reacted? And the prayer for the festival of the transfiguration. Father in heaven, whose son Jesus Christ was wonderfully transfigured before chosen witnesses upon the holy mountain and spoke of the exodus he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Give us strength so to hear his voice and bear our cross that in the world to come we may see him as he is, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing. May the King of life appear to you. The Son of life shed light on you. The Spirit of life flow into you. The Holy Three come near to you. Amen. I do hope you find time later today or at another time to think through this story in more detail. Come back and join me tomorrow as we move on to Nazareth and go to um, the very beginning of Jesus's life.